So when was the period where you said you were gaffiating? When did you gaffiate? Oh, when did I grant? Gaffiate. Me? Yes. Oh, yeah, well, uh, I, I would say that, that at about the time of the uh, 15th or 16th Worldcon, and mind you, I'd gone to all of them, and at that, by that point, uh, we had been publishing Shafta books. We had published around 20 or 21 of, of, of the Shafta books at that time. And I was getting, uh, I was running out of money. And, uh, but as I say, he got up, was getting a hundred or, he was happy with that. During the rewrite, basically what had happened was Pocket Books had given us uh, a certain amount of money uh, for the book, for, for this new book that would be published and would win the contest, the best new science fiction novel thing. And, and as I say, from that money, we were paying him monthly to, to do the rewrite, but finally we, we, we were just overwhelmed with, 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 with the books because the Westmore book was killing him. And, uh, but he had gotten about half the money uh, and I got the checks, the, the canceled checks to prove it. He had gotten yeah. about half the money from the contest. Now we didn't, weren't able to finish it because we, we just ran out. Okay, so that was around 1958 or so? Uh, that sounds about right. Okay, and um, so from about 1958, to 1986, you said you came back to fandom uh, when uh, Ray Bradbury was guest of honor. Yes. No. Okay. And, and I went down with Steve. Everybody knows my, my son, Steve Korshak, who, by the way, uh, is the greatest collector of science fiction art in the world. Now, there are other big collections. Steve and I have a collection. He's the he's the brains behind. We've got. There's no question. Uh, you can go online and see what we own. We own about a hundred and some of the best of, of well, science. We'll, we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes if we can. Um, when you came back, John to... Wolheim was guest of honor in New Orleans. Not, not Bradbury. We went down and saw Don Walheim was. Oh, but Bradbury was there. He was there, but I think it was 1985 or 86. Don Walheim. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. I had misstated. Don Walheim was the guest of honor. Ray was at the convention. Don Walheim was a very old friend. Okay, Don Walheim great, was great guy. Mm -hmm. And one of the. Uh, very, very early fans. Because when it's going to say hello and then hang around with Don. Okay, so that would have been about 1990, no, 1988, I believe he was the guest of honor at okay, uh, New Orleans. Okay, came back. All right, and New I Orleans. I've gone to every convention since then, if they were in the United States. Although I did go to the one in... Uh, in Helsinki, Finland. Ah, oh, uh, that's, well, um, that's one that I missed. But um, <laughs> okay. going to, um, um, yeah, Ray Bradbury had been the guest of honor in 1986. Okay, okay. Um, so you were gone for about uh, 30 years. Yes. When you came back, um, you and uh, Steve, were amongst the um, well-known, uh, began to be amongst the well-known collectors. You were also, um, and I think Steve edited uh, several books on art um, in which you and he published. Yes, that's correct. Can you and possibly Steve uh, tell us about that? Without me, before uh, uh, he, had, he had done uh, uh, several Bradbury books. Oh, they're the definitive books on Ray Bradbury. 
Pardon? On the spot, Bradbury wrote an introduction. Oh, on the spot. spot? Okay. Bradbury wrote the introduction. Bradbury yeah, he did two, the he, yeah, he did two books on uh, on his spot. Um, and uh, by the way, you... we we published Honest Bach more than anybody else. The first five, the first six or seven Riazzo books all have Bach chest jackets, and they're very gorgeous. I yes, they um... are. And <laughs> and that Hannes was a very dear friend. Yes. Yeah, I'm a great fan of Hannes Bach. The um, so when you uh, came back, what got you back into publishing uh, books again? Well, as I say, uh, my son had already done uh, what was the name of that company? Uh, Miller uh, Underwood Miller. Underwood Miller. He had done uh, these books about Bach and with Bradbury and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but then we decided, hey, why don't we bring back Shasta a little bit, uh, and 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 we'll do the the the, the publishing uh, of the art books. And so we have done, uh, as you know, uh, not only the definitive Frank R. Paul, uh, but uh, Margaret Brundage uh, and J. Allen St. John. My son edited all of those and wrote to all of those. Well, you know, anyway, <laughs> my son got interested. And so I, I came back into the field because my son, you know, ne needed a little a little extra guidance because he I knew all these people. Well, since we're talking about art, how did you and Steve start getting to really collect seriously uh, the art that you have? Well, wait, uh, Joe, I don't know why I understood that question. Okay, how did you and Steve uh, really start getting uh, collecting art? Oh, when and how? Well, as it, well, the way it started uh, when when I closed Shasta down, uh, it was about 1956 or 57 or 58, somewhere in there. At this moment, uh, we put everything in storage. Uh, and uh, when I left my office in Chicago, that's where she asked him, we had an office there, a very nice one. And uh, so when we closed it down, I, I put all the records, including the artwork, because in most of those cases, I owned the artwork. Uh, and I paid the artist extra for the artwork, and it kept, and it kept it. So there, and so my son said to me one day, you know, Daddy says I like this stuff. He said, can you take it out of storage, and 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 I like to kind of collect it. And and I thought, well, hey, why not? Uh, so uh, uh, we did, and uh, uh, by that time, of course, my son had grown up, and and he's practicing the law, and uh, and uh, you know. And he decided he liked it, but he loved the artwork. He's not a great reader of science fiction, but he loves the artwork. And so we put together, well, I already had 20 or 25 covers or, or things that I owned, including some very special things. And I just might mention this separately. We had one of the great J. Allen St. John uh, uh, John Carter paintings. I'm in Ray Palmer's office one day. Ray was such a sweetheart. And I see behind his desk, John Carter and the City of the Mummies, which was a cover that they that Ray had, had done uh, for Ziff Davis in his office. And it was in his office. It's an, ori it's an original oil on canvas. Listen to this. And so I'm looking at this, and 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 I said to Ray, "Hey, I said that's the thing, John." He said, "Yeah." He said, "You like it?" I said, "I love it." He says, "You can have it." Now, in those days, these artists didn't care to have the stuff back. They thought that science fiction was just uh, sort of a bread and butter thing. They all wanted they all wanted to be in the Louvre 
Well, they all wanted to be in the Art Institute or wherever. See, they all thought they were fine artists, which is fine. It's free. Everyone has to have a, you know, some feeling about their own ability. And so they didn't care whether they got the science fiction art back or not. That's why there was so much stuff available for the auctions at the convention, because the artists didn't want them back. They were interested, you know, in fine art. Anyway, that being the case, we, so here, anyway, that's how we just started. So he says, take it. Now, if in those days, listen to this, that painting was selling, if you want to sell it, we, we own it, we don't sell it. We might trade up, but we don't sell. Thank God we don't have to. But in those days, we had this, we had the ark, and uh, in those days, that cover, I had turned down $75,000, and Ray gave it to me as a gift. Now, I could have sold that for $75,000, but we didn't do it. We didn't, we wanted the painting. We still own it. We own it. But my, my, my point is that I got in early with the artwork and, and my son took it over and he has made a, an incredible collection. We own everybody that and the best. The only person that we don't own of the top people so far is Max Hill Parrish. He's in the millions. Hopefully we're gonna end up with something from him not going to be easy because it's a lot of money, even for us, especially for my son, who's been very successful and able to 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 buy to buy and, and, and build the collection. Well, the um, Murray Moore put an online link into the chat for people so that they can look at your collection. Um, can um, you? Um, both uh, talk about uh, the collection that is currently going on circulating to museums? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. We've had a number of major, major uh, uh, museum shows. We're, we're, we're even getting further than that. We're coming into the most important collected museums in the country. Uh, we have exhibited uh, in museums in both Spain uh, and in Japan. In both of those cases, those countries paid my, for my son and his wife to go there for the, for the art show. Imagine. And uh, the Shasta collection has, has uh, sometimes only one or two paintings, sometimes more, has been seen not only widely so far in this country, but also in Europe and in Asia. Well, I've seen your collection. Um, I've been to Steve's and uh, seen the pieces he has. And I've also seen the exhibit at least twice uh, as it's been around. And I do recommend if anybody has a chance to go see it. Well, you can uh, go online and see what we've got. If they want, they'll see that I'm, that I'm not making this up. When, when they see what what has been accumulated in the Korshak collection, they all agree, agree with me. Although well, there are several other good collections too, but okay. I think we've got the best. Uh, Joe, but, can I can I add something? Certainly. Uh, just, this is my father's interview. I'm not trying to take over my father's interview, but just one or two quick things I wanted to comment. Uh, the collection started originally because my father introduced me to a lot of old fans like Daryl C. Richardson and Ackerman and, and Moskowitz. And we started trading at first. As the, uh, as the field evolved, uh, the people that got the paintings for free as fans like Ackerman uh, were eventually starting to pass off. And then social, a new generation of collectors evolved. Those were the entrepreneur collectors like uh, Bob Weinberg, and Jerry Delery, uh, stewardship. These were people that would buy collections or, or represent people and sell collections and keep 
part as as their profit. Um, and then we started trading with them and even starting to buy with them. And then the third evolutionary phase was where the nouveau riche started coming into the field. And that's when it wasn't possible to trade. He's talking any Paul time. Allen now. Yeah. At any rate, I wanted to just mention that, but that was because my father originally started introducing me. We did a lot of trades for a long time. Another thing I wanted to mention is that you might want to ask my father that according to Lloyd Curry, uh, he was, my father was the first oh, science okay. fiction book dealer. Right. <laughs> uh, so you might want to ask him about that as well. The, okay. Uh, well, it happened, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it. Uh, in in the, the late 1930s, before, before Tri Nikon won, uh, I, I started buying and selling science fiction. It was mostly magazines in those days, although there was also books. And uh, the, the thing is, I was the first science fiction specialist professional in buying and selling. Other people had in their fan magazines or whatever would sell sometimes uh, some of the, their holdings. They would sell because they needed the money or this or that. I would buy, not, not to dispose of my stuff, but to have money to buy more, you see. I was doing it professionally, and so I would reinvest the money when somebody else, a fan, would sell something. Say Ackerman would sell something. He needed the money. He put it in his pocket. And, and that was the end of it. But I would do a sell it so that I could buy more to sell more to buy more. So in a sense, I was kind of the first science fiction specialist book book and magazine salesperson. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, um, and being one of the early publishers, I guess it's sort of an offshoot of that. <laughs> well, in those days, you could be the first if you were just around, because there were so few. <laughs> right. Yes. Let me get back to, if I could, to another question about the art. I'd like each of you to tell us, if you could, what is your favorite piece of art in your collections? Well, I, I, I don't think that, that there's any question. Uh, Steve, why don't you tell them? come in and John Carter and the Princess of Mars. Uh, you want to, when we showed that painting uh, at the, uh, at the, um, at the, uh, at the Doug Ellis show. Windy City. Windy City. Windy City. They Windy. lined up to see it. Well, there were only five, there were five, four, four schoonovers. Four schoonovers. There were only four schoonovers that were science fiction. Schoonover became a very famous American painter. Right. But he had done four uh, 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 on, in the Burroughs at the time, when he worked some things for Burroughs, when he was coming up, including the Princess of Mars. John Carter and the Prince, it is magnificent. It is, a, uh, it is an oil on canvas. It's huge. When we bought that, we brought it to the Windy City Con, and everybody lined up for blocks at a time just to come up and look at it. That's how famous it was. And that's probably, uh, we've turned down over, over $100,000 for that painting. Uh, on a number of occasions, including people like Paul Allen wanted to come in there and buy it. Well, it is a striking, it is a striking piece. I enjoy it. Yeah. Um, Steve, is that also your favorite? Well, when people ask me this question, I tell them it's a little bit like asking if there was a fire, which one of your children would you say? Right, um, it is. So sometimes there's a favorite because of the way you discovered a painting. Uh, and you tracked it down. Sometimes there's a favorite because uh, you relate to that painting emotionally or the story. Uh, there's different 
ways it, it can be. Sometimes it's because you believe that it's a, it's a beautiful artistic work of art. Um, you know, as the collection has grown, as my father uh, said, that uh, that John Carter Amazing Stories cover was put in my bedroom. And that that's what started me. Uh, I used to imagine myself in the scene of that painting uh, with John Carter. So you're talking about City of the Mummies. Yeah, City of the Mummies. Yeah, it was in your bed. But as the collection's grown, it's, it's not just about pulp uh, science fiction covers anymore. It's not even just about science fiction. Uh, it's, it's really about illustrations of imaginative literature. So there's European fantasy like Arthur Rackham uh, and Jose Segreus of Spain. Uh, and and, and, and so, we own all of those people. <laughs> so it, it's, it's grown into many different aspects. And, and um, you know, for me, I would say, uh, if you ask me for a couple, it, it would be that John Carter, City of the Mummies. It would be Margaret Brundage's which is marked the famous Weird Tales cover. It would be Jose Segreus' War of the Worlds. It would be John Carter, uh, uh, well, it'd be the Princess of Mars, excuse me, the Schoonover cover. And, uh, and maybe Arthur Rackham's uh, uh, Alice, in Wonder. Alice in Wonderland. We own all of those. Yeah, well, I don't have any ambitions for any of those because they're beyond me. But I, you also have my favorite fantasy piece too, which is uh, like I said, Hannes Box, and it's Rose for Ecclesiastes, which is such a small little piece. Sometime you should share it with us. Anyway, um, we've covered an but awful you know, lot. It's interesting uh, on, the, on the Rose. Uh, yes. Nobody has the painting uh, because it was, it started out that uh, we were going to use that painting uh, the Thomas did, but th then as it developed, uh, Ray Palmer was going to publish that, was going to publish Rose. Magazine of Science Fiction and Fantasy uh, did and, and finally published it. But so Ray was going to do the book. Then he realized that he was getting in over his head because it's a little different for the expertise to publish books or to publish magazines. So he came to us and we became partners with Ray uh, on publishing uh, where, where we used that cover. But somehow I never got the original. All we own is the original proof and a small uh, vignette that uh, Hannes did showing what he was going to put into that painting which is unusual because Bach was a kind of a guy, take it or leave it. Excuse me, can I correct? Sure. You're, you're talking about Kinsman of the Dragon. Oh, I'm sorry. Not, not Rose for Ecclesiastes. Okay, go ahead. No, that was one where there was a preliminary that Bach did for Kinsman of the Dragon. You're Rose, right. Rose for Ecclesiastes was not involved with Shasta. It was done with, uh, 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 it, was a, it, was a, it was a magazine, uh, 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 cover it was I think it was fantasy and science fiction. Joe, yes, it was. By right. the way, I, as we're talking here, I'm, I just want to make one small correction. My father was correct. His first show was 1986 with Ray Bradbury in Atlanta, and then 1988 we went to Don Wallheim in New Orleans. I'm sorry to jump, but I just want to correct the record for history. 1987, I believe, was in England, so he didn't go to that show, but. He was correct. He did go to uh, 1986, Ray Bradbury, guest of honor. Yeah, because Ray is such a close. Yes. Well, we've covered a lot. Um, is there any particular memorable moment in fan, in your fan history that we haven't covered and you'd like to tell people about? I'm perfectly neutral and, and, and willing to touch on any subject if I have any knowledge. Well, can I suggest two stories that I think are very uh, uh, interesting and fascinating that my father could talk about? One would be his, Please do. One would be his encounter with Aldous Huxley, where he had lunch with Aldous Huxley. And the other he could talk about would be uh, L. Ron Hubbard offering Earl to publish Dianetics. Both of those subjects, I think, would be uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm stories. glad you brought that. That's interesting. I would. Yes, please. 
uh, among other things in my career, uh, I got involved. Uh, John Farrar, uh, Farrar, Strauss, and Young was a, a personal friend. Uh, you know, by this time, Shasta was, was already on the move going into general publishing. And, I, and, I, and we had the idea of doing the best science fiction stories of the year, uh, which, which we did. There were three people that owned it, myself, Blyler, and Dickey. My name doesn't appear because that doesn't matter, but the royalties were divided between the three of us. There were no other best of the year. Now there are all kinds of best of the year books. Right. But for many years, it was published uh, actually by Frederick Bell. Well, in any event, uh, oh, we, we did a book or two with, with, with John Farrar. In any event, uh, I don't know how I got into this. You're talking about Aldous Huxley. Right, and right. Every year we had an introduction to that series. And we would get, ask a famous person in the field if they would write the introduction. Uh, and so, uh, among other people, uh, we had Vincent Sterrick, we had a number of other people well known in the field, uh, not in, 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 in books and so on, right. and to the public. So we decided who could be more, more uh, famous to write the introduction than Aldous Huxley. So anyway, I got in contact with him and he invited me to come and, and, and have lunch with him. He, at that time, uh, was living up at Big Bear uh, in, uh, in California. Uh, and so he said, why don't I come up and have lunch with me? So I, I did. Of course, I wanted to get him to, to write the introduction to the best science fiction story. Started with 19, 1949, 50, 51, 52. We did it for seven, eight years. So anyway, so I came, came, I went and had lunch with him. Un unexpectedly, I didn't know his lunch habits. He would separate the food. I didn't know this. And what he would do is he would take a bite of food, he would masticate it, blah, 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 and he would spit it out. Now I'm having lunch with him, and, and unex I have no idea he did this. This is not, it, it doesn't, it doesn't increase your appetite, you see. And then he would take a wad of food, he would chew it, and he would put it on the plate. And then it would end up by having a dozen of these balls of chewed food where he had extracted the juices from it and the vitamins and the minerals, you see. That was his theory, which is okay. But I had no idea about it, so believe me, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Anyway, that was my lunch with, with, with all this Huxley. I must have been a very strange experience. It, it was, <laughs> unexpected. But he was very courteous, and, uh, and I had a wonderful chat with him. But it didn't go anywhere, because at that time, he was, he was doing a play on Broadway. Uh, and uh, uh, he was on his way to New York, and uh, he had a, a, a it never, it never, I never got any further with it, with him, but that was my, my lunch with Aldous Huxley, and I'm glad I did it, because hey, he was, the man was very interesting, excepting for his uh, eating habits. <laughs> well, I think that'll be um, make for a notable footnote for um, Aldous Huxley biographers right. uh, who might not know about that. Story about. Uh, Dianetics. Dianetics. Oh, yes. Well, di tell us about Ron your Hubbard, experience. Ron Hubbard and I were very close. Uh, Ron thought the chapter was, was the greatest. And uh, uh, he was married to his first wife at the time. Uh, and uh, the three of us used to, used to do used to go out at night in New York. Uh, there was uh, uh, an, an area where they had all late clubs. Mm -hmm. and we, used, 
we, we would go and see people like Edith Piaf and so forth uh, at night, late at night. Ron was living in those days uh, at the Explorers Club in New York. And uh, uh, in, in any event, when he came up with Dianetics, he offered me to, to publish the book. Now, at that time, we had already published Slaves of Sleep. He was happy with that. And we'd published a number of other books. And, 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 and he offered me, and if I had any brains, I would have said, send me the man. How fast can you get it over here? But I loved Ron, and I said to him, and I told him the truth. I said, Ron, I said, look, we publish science fiction. I said, nobody pay attention to this. If you, you need a technical publisher, a science, medical, whatever. And, and he listened to me, and he, and he went with some company, I forget the name of them, in Philadelphia. Uh, and, and of course, it turned out to be a book that sold as much as the, as the Bible. And I could have been a millionaire had Ron offered it to me, and I shot myself on the foot by, by, by trying to do the right thing by Ron, because we couldn't have done what they did. Well, I didn't realize that you had a shot at Dianetics. It's, um, it would have certainly been, um, but it certainly has been one of the most controversial books published. Yeah, but of course, there was so much money in it. Who cared about the controversy <laughs> if it came down to that? I'm sorry, Joe. Go ahead. No, no. Um, I, Steve, I'm glad you brought those two items up. They were great stories. Is there any others that, um, since uh, you know your dad and his life much better than I do, that you'd like to suggest? Well, <laughs> The only other little story, and I'll tell this real quick. I've got a million of them, but, but look at, take this one. I'm in Portland at the, at the World Con. Uh, I had driven from Chicago, save money, and, and, have, and then I was going down to LA from Portland, and, and, and of course, four years there. So, and I'm going to go down to Los Angeles, and four, he says to me, uh, Earl, he said, if you're going down, to, can you give me a ride back to Los Angeles? I said, certainly, for you. So now, in those days, they didn't have the interstates like we have now. Now, your, your, your roads from one big city to another are kept outside of cities. Then, your, your main U.S. highways went right through a city. And... And I had a taste for Dairy Queen. <laughs> you know, that, that ice cream, that kind of soft ice cream. Absolutely. And, and, and as you know, they always had Dairy Queens at the, at the edge of town because the rents are cheaper and people can park and drive in. And of course, the highway always went right to the city. So as we went from Portland toward Los Angeles, we went to a number of cities and there wasn't a single Dairy Queen. And I was complaining, I said, no Dairy Queen. Finally, we get to the edge of Los Angeles and there's a Dairy Queen. So I said, my goodness, there's a Dairy Queen. I'm... And, and Corey says, yes, he says, listen to this one, Cusher's Laugh Dam, a double pun. Think of it, Cush, not cut. Custard, the ice cream, custard, yep. that dessert. Sounds like general custard, see? Last Dan. Custard's last Dan. That's Gloria Ackerman. That's a great story. I'll, I'll, I'll add a story uh, to this, Joe. Yeah. <clears throat> we were at the Allentown Convention, uh, not convention, uh, our museum exhibition, having dinner with uh, among uh, many people, among them Michael Whalen and my father were at a table talking. And I turned to my father and I, and I, I, you know, I thought this would be an interesting question, especially in Michael Whalen's presence. And I said, Dad, you've known a lot of the great people in first fandom uh, personally uh, and interacted and, and business-wise and friendship-wise. You know the field. 
you, you know, Bradbury and Asimov and, and uh, Hubbard and, and Campbell and all these people. And in your opinion, who do you think was the greatest influence in science fiction in, in those days? And I was surprised at the answer my father gave. He, he didn't mention an artist like J.L. and St. John, Frank R. Paul, or, or, or a publisher or an artist. He mentioned a fan. He said Forrest J. Afton. And his reason, you want to say the reasoning or you want me to say it? Well, go ahead. His reasoning was that Ackerman was one of the first great collectors of, of the field. Uh, he, was a, he was an agent. He was a movie actor, a stand-in movie actor. No, he was with Vincent Price in right. all those movies. Um, and, and, and among many other things, agent, many other things. But the thing that I think my father was pointing to why he, Ackerman he thought was so important, aside from being called Mr. Science Fiction, he was constantly promoting science fiction, and his Acker Mansion was was visited by so many important people like Spielberg and Lucas and on and on that he influenced a whole generation of, of fans, of later fans. And I was surprised with that answer. But when you think about it, there's a lot of a lot of sense to that answer. Well, I I can understand you're looking at that. And when you, since science fiction is so pervasive in the media these days, Fari did have a tremendous input into all of that media because of his magazine, Famous Monsters. Um, and, you know, that alone would have made him famous um, in the, to the general public, let alone all of the famous activities he did as a fan. Before we go any further, I do want to mention that uh, to all of the people we have here and to get it on our recording, that Earl is also going to be the guest of honor next year at the Worldcon in Chicago, ChiCon 8, I believe. And um, you should all come and talk to him in person. You're absolutely right. And, and if you tell me that you were part of the audience at the interview that I had with Joseph Clary, I will, I will be even more, more effusive uh, in, 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 uh, in relating to you. <laughs> Go okay. ahead. Now, I think one of the things um, we want to do is open this up to a few more questions from the audience. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. It, it, and let me say that I would be, I'm happy to do this. Uh, and, and, and I'm glad to pass a little information that some of these things you hadn't known before. Because, you know, we're all just mortal. And I mean, I'm, I'm almost immortal. <laughs> I'm now going on 98. And my only point is, that I can't be around to answer these kind of questions at a later point, because time, you know, d deals strongly with with everyone. And well, uh, so, if you have a question, now's the time to answer it, because I can't guarantee that I'll be able to answer it in the near future. Well, I hope you can answer them. Um just like Bob Madel, until you're way past 100. Yes, I know. Of course, Bob and, and I are very close. Okay, so uh, Mark or Edie, can you open this up for questions? Well, go ahead. Anyone with a question, I'm your man. Okay, does hey. anyone have any? Hey, Earl, you, were you a member of the Science Fiction League, and do you remember your membership number? <clears throat> I remember the Science Fiction League. Uh, I don't remember the membership number. Uh, I wasn't terribly impressed with it. At the time that, uh, that, that I started into the field, uh, it was still operating, but it was operating very, it wasn't an important factor any longer. It was a great idea uh, when uh, uh, Hornig and uh, Gernsback came up with it, 
Uh, incidentally, it might, it might interesting. Uh, it, it reminds me of of a great great man uh, who you all have heard of. He was a very close friend of mine, and I'm talking about uh, Charlie Hornet. And uh, as you know, I think he was 17 or something like that, uh, and uh, Gernsback made him editor of Amazing Stories. I th or was it Wonder? It was Wonder. All right. It was Wonder Stories. Magazines that he had at the time. So uh, I, I got to know Charlie, and we became very dear friends. And he was one of the great people in science fiction. Uh, and as you know, during the war, uh, you probably have heard this, he was a conscientious objector. Uh, and consequently, uh, he was in, he was very much impressed with the Hopi Indians. The Hopi uh, are an Indian group that are non-warlike. All the other tribes respect the Hopi and don't attack the Hopi. That's a fact. Uh, and uh, uh, he wrote a book uh, on the Hopi called The Hopi Story. And one of, the, one of the sadnesses of my life, we signed that up, of course, for the new, the new nonfiction line that did the Westmore book. We had other famous authors, but we had Charlie Horning's The Hopi Story, and I, one, of the, one of the sadnesses of my life, it was a good book, and I wanted to publish it. We had it signed up, but I, I went out of the business before I could do that. But uh, I, I just thought I would mention that he was a man of many talents and uh, a great, a great early fan. Go ahead, anything else? Who else? So you didn't ask me about Charlie Horning, but as long as I was talking about it, I, I thought I'd mention it. No, any details that come up and pop into your head um, are welcome. We, um, you know, I don't know everything by any means, and uh, uh, details would be wonderful. Um, I don't have the chat on my uh, screen, were there any other questions in the chat that... Uh, I have a question, actually. Yeah, uh, what's your name? Oh, yes. my name's Orton. I'm kind of new, but... Yeah, go sure, ahead. Uh, did you, by chance, attend the costume ball at SheCon? Uh, at, at what convention? Uh, the first SheCon. The convention in, in Seattle. No, in Chicago. Oh, Shikon. Shikon, sorry. Uh, are you talking about 1940? Yeah. Uh, yes, I did. I, and very frankly, uh, I, I remember now what I did. I went to a uh, to to a to a, a theatrical uh, company. That, that rented costumes. Uh, unlike people like Flory who made their own costume, uh, uh, I wasn't that talented. So I had to go to a, a, a costume company. Uh, and, and I came, I rented a, a Roman uh, uh, centurion kind of costume that looked like metal and, and it had a helmet and, uh, you know, and a sword. And, and I, but I rented it for the for the night for the uh, convention. Ah, cool. Is it, uh, is it true that they gave away some uh, Paul paintings as prizes? I, I'm not sorry. I don't understand the question. Uh, I heard that some Frank R. Uh, Paul paintings were given away for prizes. Uh, you heard that some what was given Frank away? Frank R. Paul paintings. What? Frank R. Paul paintings. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so that, that that would be that would be true. Uh, but let me say this: 
uh, when it came to giving away uh, artwork, uh, the greatest of them all uh, was Hubert Rogers. I, I, I don't mean to get off the Paul thing, although let me say, let me add this. Well, let me talk to you about Frank R. Paul for a moment. Uh, the year before I went to uh, back to Chicago, the year before Tricon, my, my mother and father had moved to New York for a year. My mother had a big job. She was a designer of women's clothing. Uh, and so we went to New York and I went to high school in New York. I went to the most famous high school in New York. Uh, and it still probably is. It's, it's Peter Stuyvesant High School. Uh, it's an extraordinary school. And I mentioned this because it was only a couple of blocks from, pardon, <coughs> excuse me, from Frank Paul's office around Union Square. Union Square is around 14th Street, for those of you who don't know, in Manhattan. So occasionally, before going home from high school, I would stop in the, at, at Paul's office. He was only about a block from the subway. And, and, and he was so great. Now I have a Christmas card coming up. I wanted, in those days, we didn't have any money. So I had drawn on a, on a uh, mimeograph stencil, and, and I'm no artist, I had drawn a, a Christmas card scene. And I showed it to, to him. And he said, here, let me, <laughs> let me have, he took a stencil and he drew my Christmas card and gave it to me, and, and, and don't charge, of course, as a president. <laughs> that was Frank R. Paul. Yeah. Since we just brought up the um, Shikon again, I did want to ask you something that yes, is no. mentioned in, in, um, in the histories, uh, Warner's history, and ask you um, what uh, occurred. It was you hosted the first day of Shikon because Mark, um, even though he was chairman, could not do it. Can you tell us what happened that you ended up hosting that? What, wait a minute, I don't quite understand. I heard you, but I don't understand the question. Okay. Um, according to Warner's history, Mark... Oh, Harry Reinsberg, Warner Jr. Yes, yeah. Harry Warner Jr. Uh, Mark Reinsberg um, was unavailable to host the first day oh, of I the shy time, question, yes. and you did it. Can you tell us what happened? <clears throat> yeah, well, let me tell you this. Mark was a, was a one-man army, and I want to mention this for the history of fandom. Mark Reinsberg came up with the idea independ independently of moving the convention. In those days, world cons or any kind of conventions were only held in the east coast either in philadelphia or new york city mark came up with the idea and he said look he said what we've got to do he, he said this to, to, to the convention is move the convention to a different city across the country every year so that everybody can get a chance to go to world cons you see so Mark said, look, the first year here is New York. Now, we, we got Chicago. They Everybody agreed Chicago. He said, the next year, he said, we'll do Denver. And the last year, the fourth year, we'll do Los Angeles. The idea being that this way, fans in each part of the country would have it easy to get. And that's what's happened. And since then, it's spread out to the entire world. And Mark Reinsberg was the one that that got brought that idea up. Bingo, and it's and it goes on now. Now we're in Europe and Asia and everywhere else. With Why didn't Mark host the first World Cup? Why didn't Mark host the first World Cup? Why did you? Host? Well, he was such a hard worker. It's not the first World, the second yes, World Cup. He was such a hard worker. I helped as much as I could, but man, he was like a one-man army. And uh, he was so exhausted 
uh, by the time the convention came up, uh, he was so worn out. Night and day he was at it, and he collapsed. Uh, and I was number two. I was secretary treasurer of the convention, and so I became the chairman because he, he just collapsed. And, uh, and so I became uh, chairman of the second World Science Fiction Convention. But, but not, not on purpose, by accident. I see. Okay. Well, um, let's go on there. Um, was there some other questions? Anyone? Speaker, forever hold your peace. Otherwise, you have to hold it until at least till. Um, it doesn't Shiker. matter how ridiculous the question is. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it. Is there anything oh, in, in the Earl, chat? Do you have any, do you have any uh, stories about Bob Tucker? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, Bob was older than, than Mark and I. Oh, I can tell you two wonderful stories. <laughs> Bob. Uh, Bob was, he was the best, the best. Uh, anyway, he was older than Mark and I, uh, not by a lot, but maybe five or 10 years or something like that. So he was an adult. He was at least in his 20s and we were in our teens. And uh, uh, in any event, what we did was, uh, we, 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 we formed a group called the Illini Fantasy Fictioneers. And to, because Bob wasn't in Chicago, although he was, he was one of the big three of the of Shikon, Reinsberg, Korshak, and Tucker were the big three. Roberts and Meyer were friends of ours and sort of hang out. So, when the convention was over, now, now we had some money because what happened was we had all that wonderful artwork and uh, we were able to, uh, to sell it. And uh, uh, as a consequence, uh, there was a couple of hundred dollars left over. So in those days, we didn't pass the money from one convention to another. We've divided it. <laughs> it made two hundred dollars. I don't mean, but that was sizable money. And I'll never forget in the hotel room. Now, now the money is. We got a few bucks, maybe a couple of hundred, two, maybe three. I don't think that much. And so now Bob and I are sitting down, and so we said, "Hey, look. So we'll divide it among the five of us." He says, "And we'll make four shares." He says. Reinsberg gets one fourth, one fourth. I get one fourth, he gets one fourth, two half share, Meyer and Roberts each get a half share. And they and so they, they that's how we divided the money in the hotel room. <laughs> we didn't pass it on, and then did in any of the other early conventions. They they had the money to pay their bills. We were able to pay our bills and kept a couple of hundred ahead. Now, I think the story that you want to know about the painting, uh, uh, there was a Paul painting. Uh, uh, what was the story for that? Uh, uh, what was it for the story? What story was that? Do you remember? Uh, <clears throat> that was the back cover, uh, amazing back cover of Life on Neptune, I think, that you auctioned off. Oh, what, what, was that the he one was that I was talking about that? if they were given away for free, not if they were auctioned off. He was wondering if any of them were given away for free. Oh, artwork? You mean? Yeah, right? Well, at the end of the auction, if we still had a bunch of stuff, then we would take it and throw it out, and the, anybody could grab it. And incidentally, some of the greatest paintings, E. 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 Smith, the famous one with Kimball Kimison. Yeah, and, and uh, all these great. I auctioned originally, but the one that we have, uh, that, that city of the future, Life on Neptune, I think. Was that it? Something like that. 
The class city of Europa. Uh, okay, there, there you go. We own that. And here's the fun part. I sold it at the, at, we're at the Shikon for maybe three or four dollars. See, nobody had any money. That was big money for a painting. Uh, an original color on uh, uh, Frank R. Paul for three, four dollars. Now it's worth 15 or 20 or 30,000. Anyway, years later, it came up for auction and we ended up by buying it. And my son paid $23,000. And we have the photograph, it's in the fall book of me holding it up to sell that painting. And Paul, Paul had, 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 had the magazines had given it to us to sell at the auction. I sold it for three or $4. Years later, when we were collecting, my son paid $23,000. It's worth more even now for, for that painting. And, and I could have had it for the three or four dollars. <laughs> I mean, had I bought it, but I, you know, we, we weren't collecting art in those days. Well, yeah, I was the one who asked that question. So. At the end of the auction, you literally gave paintings away. Yes. Well, wow. we weren't going to take them home. What are we going to do? There were piles of them. And incidentally, the, all the editors in those days, there were only a few, uh, were very generous. And uh, uh, you see, the difference is, I think I mentioned this already. In those days, these artists were not thinking of science fiction as being worth anything their paintings, they were doing that for bread and butter. And they all felt that they that their career was to, to, to do fine art. Now the greatest of them all, and I, I might mention this in passing, uh, was Hubert Rogers. Uh, and uh, uh, Hubert and I became very, very dear friends. Uh, he lived up in, uh, uh, in uh, Brattleboro, Vermont, and I uh, used to visit him all the time, stay with him. He was a great guy. Uh, as an example, uh, when I was doing the third Heinlein book uh, in the Future History series, uh, it was called "If uh, Revolt in 2100. I'm up there with, with Hubert, and he had already done the covers for the man who sold the moon uh, for the Dutch wrapper, the artwork, uh, and he had done the cover for the Green Hills of Earth, which of course I published all of those. And uh, uh, so we needed the cover for what we, it was originally called If This Goes On in the magazines, and there were some other stories that we put it together uh, as Revolt in 2100. Now let me say, that Hubert Rogers, he was the official portrait painter of the Canadian government. Uh, and his paintings are all uh, in government house in Ottawa. He had painted Queen Elizabeth and Sir Winston Churchill from life, not from photographs, they sat for him. So now, and he didn't do covers and paintings from photographs, he had the person in the sit for him live. So now I needed the cover, the artwork for Revolt in 2100. And I said, well, Hubert, geez, I need that artwork. We're ready to go to press with the book. So he says, well, why don't you pose for it? I said, come on. I said, I love it. No, he said, you pose for it. So I posed for it. And if you look at the cover, of the Shasta book uh, for uh, Revolt 2100, that's me at age 30. And it's exactly like I looked in those days. It was great. And I own it. And then he gave it to me. Well, <laughs> so that, that's what would happen in those days if you were just around, you see. Uh, that's great. Um, I have seen that cover and I'm sorry, I just did not realize it was you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you wouldn't know. 
I don't look like I looked at 30. Yeah. But I know you today, Joe. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, that's a perfect story to close on. We have Earl, another question Earl. from Joe. Wait. Uh, Sandra Bond has a question. Sandra, oh, would you please? Okay. Sorry, me? Earl. Yes. Have one. Yes. Hi, Earl. I am just. Oh, there. Hi there. I'm and just curious. Are, and what is your name? I'm Sandra Bond from England. All right. And cool. I'm just a little curious. A little curious about one book that Shasta published. Yes, go ahead. Which, um, which is a book called Murder in Millennium Six by yes. Kerm yes. Gray. Good story. I can tell you some yeah. stories about. I know. That, yeah, it's it has a little reputation of uh, being somewhat mysterious because. As far as I'm aware, Kerm Gray never published anything else in... That's correct. So can you tell us anything about Kerm Gray or the book? Yes, I can tell you about that. That's an interesting story that I can tell. Uh, I can tell a lot of stories about it. Uh, we got the book. Now, at this point in time, we've already published five or six or seven books, and they were all reprints. They were reprints of stories that had appeared in the magazines before we published them in books. And at this point, we were looking to expand. We're, pu we're publishers, we're the great Shasta publishers, and we want to help new talent have books. So we were very open. Now I get a letter one day, Un un unknown, uh, had never been in contact with Kerm Gray. He had seen our books and he was buying our book, but I didn't know him. You know, he was one of the, one of some thousands of customers that we had that were buying our book. And the letter was intrigued me. The letters began, suppose there was no death. Okay. That's how this started suppose there was no death and he said he said he had a book about it. so we said we said so we'll send it to us and we published it and and i'm going to tell you some other stuff about it in a moment but we published it because we wanted to encourage people or who, who weren't in the magazines only but who had written a science fiction novel. Uh, and, and, and that was, we did a number of science fiction statements that were published previously. And we were very happy that we did it. Unfortunately, a very dear friend of mine took, took exception to that book. And that was Tony Boucher. And you know who he was. He was a famous mystery writer Anthony Boucher, Tony Boucher. You know who he was. He was the editor of the magazine of oh, yes. fantasy and science fiction, too. So anyway, Tony didn't like the book. And he and he put it down. And then Damon Knight, who was the leading critic of that of our time, and a very prolific man, said no. It is a great book. And, and Tony reread it and rethought about it and he changed his mind because of Damon's review. Yeah, Damon's piece is reprinted in his collection In Search of Wonder, of course, which is where I'm familiar with the book from. I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the question. I'm saying that da Damon's words on Kerm Gray's book Order. You can find them in In Search of Wonder, his critical collection. This is where I know about the book from. I'm sorry. She's telling you where you can find the review by Damon Knight. By Damon Knight. Uh, yeah. That's a then good she question. Knows. She knows. She just told you. Where, where was she? She just told you in that magazine where, where his review is. Was that where yes. it was? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was in, in Damon Knight's In Search of Wonder. Was that it? Or it's, it's, it's reprinted in his book. In right. But it, in it, the also, I think it appeared in a, in, a, in a magazine as part of his, as a review. I believe it was printed in hyphen. That's possible. I, I don't remember the, all of that, but I know that 
of all things, and Tony was was a more famous writer, uh, in, you know, than, than Damon. Uh, Damon was very articulate, however, and uh, wrote well, and uh, he changed Tony's mind by just that review uh, that he gave the book. He said, and incidentally, when we did it, uh, I asked uh, Everett Blyler what he thought, because <clears throat> Everett was, and he said, publish. I asked Mark Reinsberg, he said, publish. So people that were not Dickie or myself, we were the owner of Shasta. Liked the book, and that's another reason why we published it, because they were for it also. But the Damon thing happened later, and in the interim, Boucher was had put the book down, and that that had hurt the sales at that point. Go okay. ahead. Anything else? Any other questions from anyone? Otherwise, I think what we're going to do is say thank you and close up the program. Wait, hold on. Okay, so my son is throwing an idea. Talk about Heinlein or Demolished Man, either one of those. Oh, well, that obviously. I think that the greatest book that we published, I mean, this is an interesting side. Okay. Uh, uh, was Vester's The Demolished Man. Now, one of the tragedies in, in my life was that I was, I was also had the rights by contract to publish The Stars, My Destination. Uh, the other great Bester novel. Uh, Bester was a leader of the parade of the new science fiction, uh, the social science fiction. You know, everybody here has read The Demolished Man, of course. And I'm so happy that we published it because we published an important book, an important book that had we not published it, it had appeared in magazines, but if we hadn't published it, it wouldn't have had the, the wide influence that it ended up by having. Mm. Uh, and I'm very happy. Interestingly enough, uh, Marty Greenberg, of course, did a wonderful line of books in Gnome Press. And uh, he wanted to publish that too. Uh, you know, he wasn't stupid. <laughs> he knew what he was doing. And uh, there was Henry Cutner. I mentioned this because Henry Cutner was a personal friend. And there was a question of, so it came, what it came down to was this. We made a deal. We published The Demolished Man, and he could publish, <laughs> uh, sign up Henry Cutner and Catherine Moore. Uh, and he did them. And he did some wonderful books. They were both very well known. Henry was a very close personal friend. That's interesting because there was a group called the Sweetness of Light Boys. Uh, in, and Henry was a fan. He was a fan as much as an author. Uh, and he was part of the LASFL and all that kind of thing. And uh, he did great stories. And as I say, he was a personal friend. And if I said, Henry, we want, to, we want to be in your place. He said, certainly, you see. But so I had my choice. Either we get Cutner or we get Bester. And I picked Bester. And I'm glad I did. Now, there's another thing I want to say. We attempted and we did the most important books in science fiction at our time. Now, the reason for that was, if you look at our list, the reason we did Who Goes There is that it was the important book, a uh, story that made modern science fiction. Once again, I said this earlier, science fiction was space opera and all that kind of stuff. When you got social kind of science fiction, now, now you're talking about John Campbell's Who Goes There. And Campbell was so important because he was the editor of the town. He changed the whole field. We published it. We also published, on purpose, 
what I felt was the greatest important book of the of that of that set of the 19th 20th century. Uh, the Eschballer writes the world below. We published it because it was a keystone in the history of science fiction writing. Everybody here, I'm sure, has read it. Uh, and uh, we published that. And we knew it had, didn't have a big marker, but it was an important book. The World Below by Sidney Fowler Wright. We published that. We published Bester because that was the new wave. We published because we wanted to make, to, to, to honor and make the most important books of our time. And they're all under the chapter. Uh, the, those are exceptional books, books of lasting, in the history. Books of lasting significance. Pardon? Books of lasting significance. Right, that was our subtitle, Books of Lasting Significance. That's why we published it. Yeah. Well, you, you did publish quite a few really important books. Thank you, Earl, and thank you, Steve, for this interesting and informative interview. We really appreciate it.